I only intended to win the election. I had nothing to do. With only? Hi, I'm Common. Ruby, a series that has been quite a bit of talking point on the internet for the past few years, and I've actually talked it on this channel a couple times before. And I think it's a decent video. I mean, the editing that thing was a total mess and my voice was total garbage. So let's get this lynching started, shall we? Woo, <laughs> yeesh past me. Couldn't you learn what audio bouncing is? What the hell am I talking about? I still don't know what audio balance is. But enough about the self-deprecation. You didn't come here for a bonehead to insult himself. I hope. You came here for one of two reasons. One, you disagree with the title and are here to hate on me. Or two, you agree with the title and are just basically here to get confirmation bias that the series is bad. Well, sorry to disappoint both parties on that front, but neither are coming true. Ah, fuck you! Ruby as a series is... Confusing, and hey, with volume 7 past the halfway point, I think that... <laughs> ah, look at the top of his head! Volume 7's gonna be a train wreck, isn't it? Maybe. Confusing, as I believe the writing belongs only in one place. But also due to the fact that I keep coming back to the series, there's a certain charm to the series that just keeps pulling me back to see more. And I think that's a testament to how the series can be. Even if you have issues with it, it'll draw you back in just to see if they improved upon those issues. Well, either that, you're a weak old SOB with nothing better to do with their time. Like me! Still, I think it's important to talk about the issues that I've had with the series. But to be fair, and so I'm not treading on the same ground that I've talked about before, I'll focus on the more recent series with a more dedicated view on the latest volume, Volume 7. At the time of the script writing, the season has been concluded, but I'll still have issues with it and I'll still be interesting to bring up. I'll bring up past examples, but there will be a focus on Volume 7 in this video. So whether you sat through that summary or since you just skipped that like a normal person, I think... <laughs> and that would be... I still don't like Ruby as a whole. Why do you say that, Carmen? Get him! How are we going to get over these walls? Walls cannot stop us. The cartoon! <laughs> oh, and before we actually get into why, one more thing. You never see it come. I think one of the biggest issues that I have with Ruby is the plot contrivances that actively hurt the story. So what do I mean by that? Well, I need to define what a contrivance is so that we're all on the same page. A contrivance, in the idea of a story, is something that causes things to happen in a story that does not seem natural or believable. Or, you know, basically just ignores logic. Now. Obviously, something like that is going to be seeming to be very subjective, and it's an issue that people seem to have whenever I talk about subjects of any sort in negative light. And I believe I'm referring to something like, THIS IS OBJECTIVELY BAD, when that's not the case. How about... this? Unless it's something like an animation error or something that's extremely ugly, case in point, and I make it a point that it's objective, my points are an opinion, and should be taken as such. That isn't to say you can't argue with my opinions, but people will often flaunt it as if I'm making any criticisms out there to be more objective than they really are. That being said, and getting back to contrivances, one of the biggest examples that has cropped up in Volume 7 would have to be the Robin Hill portion. Now, obviously, when you hear the name Robin Hill, I'm sure many people will think of a certain folktale hero. Only she's not as entertaining, charming, or good, like Robin Hood. And it hurts me to say that since I happen to like Robin's voice actress, Christina V. I can feel his filthy eyes on me, hungry, wanting. They are the eyes of a degenerate, one who would make a sex slave of me. And to break this foul curse, I shall have to submit my body to all manner of pornographic acts over and over again. 
Okay, maybe that wasn't the best example, but you get the idea. But back to point, what do I mean by it being a contrivance? Well, let's bring up the first time we actually meet Robin, where we're already established that she's running for a seat on the council due to the posters, and then later, we see she's attempting to steal supplies from the government. Huh. Now, some of you might be wondering why this is an issue. Well, for one thing, this is a very dangerous thing to do. Especially considering that she's a political candidate. Oh yeah, just go on these missions that could potentially get you killed. It's not like you're committing a crime that would allow the government to shoot you down in the process. Not to mention any other potential competitors who will take that opportunity to attack her. This is even considered. I get it, she's a huntress, but you'll have to forgive me if I don't think she's that smart, as I'll get to it later. The second reason is this is a really bad image for a political candidate to have. Stealing from the government, even if it's for a good cause, it's still a crime she's committing. There's a reason why a lot of states have laws against criminals from running for office. It's to prevent them from stealing office supplies. And it's the reason why people have issues with those with government positions who have shady pasts or things that are on the border of criminally wrong. Insert your own damn Trump joke here. But hey, that's small potatoes, and I'm sure to some people, myself included, are willing to say that those are minor things in the grand scheme of the story. Fair enough. <laughs> what isn't is the framing device that comes immediately after that. If you've been keeping up with the show, then you'll know exactly where the hell I'm going to go with here. And how this little setup goes against a lot of what was established and just makes the whole thing all the more stupid. Alright, so in one of the latest episodes of Volume 7, there's a party being held for Robin winning the election. Or, you know, based on the assumption that she will win. Shock of all shocks, she doesn't with a number of people heading there. Two of the more long-ring antagonists, Tyrion, the scorpion faunus murderer, and Watts, the nerd with an oddly mesmerizing mustache and technical wizard, have a plan where they are attempting to frame Penny, a robotic character whom I also have issues with as well, but we'll save those for probably another video, for killing a lot of people at this party and attempting to kill Robin herself. You see, Penny is seen as the Guardian of Atlas, or something like that, and since Robin Hill has been critical of the head honcho Ironwood, <laughs> for putting Atlas in an embargo, rerouting supplies to make a special base communication system, and not telling anyone but his closest confidence about the plan, and throwing the fact that someone, that someone being Tyrion, has been killing people who have been shown to be against Atlas, their plan is to rally people against Ironwood by framing Penny. Now, I'm sure that with the generalized description that I just gave, it sounds like a good plan, right? <laughs> There's a few problems. Quite a few problems. One of the first would have to be security. <sighs> We're concerned about security risks. You see, that's kind of an issue. If you've ever been to a major political party or even an event that has a political person in it, you'd realize there's security. Checking for weapons, suspicious characters, and honestly checking for these sorts of things is just common knowledge. Hell, even basic security armed with proper tools and equipment is standard fare in that regard because, well... What if this happened to you? To prevent this sort of thing from happening. So either Robin Hill's staff is filled with complete idiots, or it's just coincidence. The most dangerous thing that a writer can use. The second big issue with this is the crowd. By sheer coincidence, there are no faunus in the entire crowd. At the very least, the only faunus in the entire building are Tyrion himself, Maro, a member of the Aesops, part of Atlas's elite, and the goat girl Fiona, who is a part of Robin's staff. Which is really weird, considering that she's fighting for Mantle to improve the conditions for its people. Including the faunus who are described to be discriminated against. Who are practically slaves, and treated like, well, dogs. Forgive the pun. We also have to take the other thing into consideration. Robin's opponent, Jacques Schnee, the owner of the Schnee Dust Company, and father to one of the main characters. And the show has been alluding, somewhat, that it's a racial system. So you'd figure there'd be a lot more fauna supporters to someone who would shake up that system. Now, for those who aren't familiar with the show, you're probably wondering what the heck I'm going on about. 
Well, it's been established way, way back that the Thonist have night vision, meaning they'd be able to see Tyrion attacking all these people. So, somehow, Tyrion and Watts managed to know that their plan would go off because somehow knew that there wouldn't be any Faunus with night vision at the party? Now, the Faunus with night vision is an issue, and I'll actually get back to that later, but I want to continue on this, so please be patient. Let's consider one other factor that apparently no one has thought of. Well, I take that back. Plenty of people on YouTube have thought of it, but in story, no one thought of it. And that would be... Why does no one use their flashlight on their cell phone? Okay, they aren't exactly cell phones, they're called scrolls, but they still act like cell phones, even with flashlight adjustments to them. So, no one thought to pull out their cell phones when people started screaming in the darkness? What?! Wow, Tyrion and Watts must have the ability to see the future these that everyone either left their scrolls at home or don't have a charge in them at all. Already, this plan relies on so much coincidence. That Robin's staff would be so inept that they don't check people on coming into the building for weapons. There would be no faunus with night vision, and no one would be smart enough to use their scroll to see what could be happening in the darkness. <laughs> oh, and you think I'm done? No! Oh, I don't want to go through all these issues here, but I think I've made my point with the contrivances issue. I've spent about four pages of the script talking about this. Sadly, there's more, though. Such as when the lights come back on, there's no actual blood on Penny's blades. You see, I don't know if you know this, but typically when you stab or slash someone with a weapon, particularly a blade, that tends to leave blood on them. I suppose the people in the crowd of the party were all drinking since they're unable to actually see that there's blood around the bodies and there's none on the swords. I, I really gotta get away from this topic, I'm hyper-focusing on it. <sighs> Look, I'm not gonna say the entire whole of Ruby is like this. But it's been a part of Ruby for a long time, and this is just the latest example of the contrived writing that there is in it. I'm not even saying the basic plot is bad! I'm of the mind that no idea is bad. Well, maybe some ideas are, but... Regardless, I felt that it was terrible contrivance that ruined it. Which would be fine if this wasn't introduced in the next episode! And the guy in the back who's seen this episode knows exactly what the hell I'm talking about! He's trying to help... everyone. You're telling the truth. A lie detector! She has a lie detector ability! Perfect! Sure! Why not? <laughs> it's not like they could easily prove whether or not Penny was the culprit, especially considering that Robin has no excuse but to see there's no blood on her swords. It's not like it's Bucciarati's ability to lick lies on people. It's not like Robin has to lick her targets to see if they're lying, she just needs to hold Penny's hand! I can see the answer to the solution, it's right there! You have it literally in your grasp! Oh my god! It's platypuses, that's how cold together this whole idea is! And what's worse, it's public knowledge that she has the semblance! Don't believe me? You're all aware of my semblance. Let's settle it here and now, General Ironwood. You STUPID PLATYPUSES, DO YOU NOT UNDERSTAND WHAT YOU ARE DOING?! Calm down. <sighs> this scene, this episode, the, this whole plot is gonna be the death of me, AGAIN! I don't know what to even call this other than a contrivance! Hey. Post editing common here, and I actually want to talk about another aspect of contrivances that are semi related to what I stated in the original video. And I figured since the video is already added to completion at this point, I'd like to talk about Yang and Blake, along with their decision to tell Robin about Ironwood's plans and how it doesn't make bloody sense. Robin is on our side, she always has been. What a surprise! That's the distinct tang of a liar. From what we know, including the entire show, the group doesn't know anything about Robin. All they know at this point in the show is that she's willing to commit crimes in broad daylight against the Alishan military. Her happy huntress is willing to do that until Penny caught on on the first time that Ruby actually met the woman. We, the audience, saw nothing good from Robin Hill. Nothing to the crew outside of the propaganda that every politician is supposed to do so in order to gain votes from people. However, the moment that she loses, she goes right back to stealing, for weeks apparently of the show is to be believed. That's the second shipment for Amity that was hit today. It seems election night was the last push Robin needed to go from hometown hero to full-on vigilante. 
She doesn't know if she was cheated out of her election or not. And don't give me the excuse that the attack of the rally caused this. Her semblance would have proven right then and there if Penny was the one who attacked them. Meanwhile, when you look at Ironwood, not only has he helped the crew before, but he also did the following. He made Yang's robotic arm for her, for free, and got a transport to her, which according to the show, was hard to do. He's open with what he's doing with the Amity Coliseum and the Winter Maiden, hiding nothing from the main group about this. Allows all of them to reside in the Atlas Academy, giving them clothes and upgrade weapons, again, all for free. Point is... Ironwood has been giving the team nothing but reasons to trust him. Meanwhile, there's no reason to believe that Robin Hill even believes in what she talks about. Not from what we're shown in the show. We didn't know that for sure. So Blake and Yang wanting to tell her makes no sense to me, especially with how the show shows this. There, post-editing common done. But I'm probably gonna do this again in a few minutes, so uh... Okay, we gotta talk about something else. Cut away, cut away- ah! Alright, so let's talk about something positive for a moment. One of the better aspects of Ruby that I've enjoyed is the character designs, especially the monster designs, because while I think the Grimm are utterly useless nowadays, they do look pretty cool. In the earlier seasons, you had some really good designs for the characters, and for the most part, that design work has been carried throughout the volumes pretty consistently, at least in my opinion. From way back in the day, you've got the simple white suit of Roman Torchwick, and it's a very clear design, but one that really stuck out with its lucidity. You could easily take one look at the guy and think, bad guy but a smooth criminal. Hell, even the main character designs were really fun and conservative, yet conveyed a lot about them. One example would be Weiss, with her signature color being white, being the primary coloring on her clothings, with a hint of red at the collar. Now, this is my interpretation, mind you, but it's a character design that screams that while she may be cold on the outside, there's a small part of her that's different than the exterior. It's a character design which can really tell you a lot about a character or give an impression of said character without actually saying anything. Something that you don't really typically see in a lot of character designs nowadays. Predicality and a fight aside... It's a combat skirt! Yeah! I really like the designs, and it made for at least making the characters look good. And now's the time where I gotta stop being nice. Yes, I know. But it was a fleeting dream. In the latest incarnation of the show's story, the designs of the main cast were updated, and since I know people will accuse me of fluffing up this video, I'll be concise for once in my life. I do not like the new designs for a number of reasons. The first is aside from Ruby Rose, the designs of the characters go against the principle of their color recognition. Blake's design is mostly white now because of her code, and they broke apart what was so appealing about her in their first look. The somewhat gothic vibe, the bow that gives the same effect as animal ears, them legs, long flowing raven hair. The dark blue on Weiss's design dominates her outfit, which is too busy to be elegant. And Yang, well, she's been drowning in brown shades of brown for the past few volumes now. But to me, that still isn't all that good, and just because I said I like the designs, it doesn't mean there weren't the outliers here and there, and Yang's was one of them. Ruby Rose is probably the least offender here, as she still maintains her red coloring in her design, but it's a bit more practical. But I can't give her too much slack, as the designs themselves are way too busy. You've got way too many belts and zippers, to the point where I have to wonder if the guy behind Kingdom Hearts invaded Rooster Teeth one day and infected the designers with no Morad syndrome. So you have come this far, and still you understand nothing. Now, I'm not one to shy away from intricate designs, and they can certainly work. However, to me, there's a bit of an issue in that as well, as even the smaller aspects of the designs are superfluous. Like, the worst examples here are Blake and Weiss, and I suppose Ruby with the long fabrics that can get in the way of their fights. I understand it won't happen because animation and such, but there, if there was any logic of the real world in Ruby... Ugh, logic in Ruby. That just sounds so off-putting. If there was any actual real-world logic, those sorts of outfits would be the worst things to wear in a fight. The flowing fabric could easily be grabbed onto by an enemy or could get caught on something when moving. There's a reason why actual fighters don't wear long flowing clothes, for the most part. Now, I'm sure I'm barking up the long trees since people are going to point out it's fantasy. Stop being so logical. <laughs> no. You see, the thing is, they can't play that logic there. Why? Because they're using real-world logic to justify these outfits. And I quote, 
Secondly, and probably more importantly, Atlas and Mantle are cold. We thought it might look a little silly for our characters to get one out of the four major cities in Remnant and not think about buying something a little warmer. And in case you're wondering, the first reason was actually so that way they could actually change up the design since they've been using it for a few years. I'd have to question why this logic wasn't thought of in Volume 6. You'd think they'd want to buy warmer clothing and just a single scarf. Secondly, Yang technically is dressing in less than what she already was. Zip up that leg, woman! Now, I'm not going to say that this is the be-all, end-all, and I know I've said in the past that I like complex designs like I already mentioned, but to me, most of these designs are a mess on different levels. And that's sad for me to say because for the most part, in the earlier volumes, Ruby had some really strong character designs. I don't know, I guess that as the volumes came along, the designs got weaker and weaker to me. I think you can also see this in the designs of the villains. It's almost as if the palette of the characters have gotten duller and more emphasis on brown and not so memorable designs. Again, subjective, so feel free to disagree. If you want more of an example of why I don't like the villains, I will provide a link in the description where I talk about this in my previous videos. Oh boy, I've ranted about this again, but Ruby's consistency of the world rules hasn't really improved. If anything, I'd argue that they've gotten worse. And I'm pretty sure one of the biggest offenders that people would like to hear is that of Aura. At first, it was a shield that could protect whoever's using it, then it was changed so you have to actively activate it. Then it's stated that without Aura, one can't use their semblance, but that didn't stop semblances from being used. One of the worst examples of that being Yang here. And just to clarify, her semblance does make her eyes red. Sort of a marker for this sort of thing activating. And hey, you don't believe me about this situation? BOOM! The writer's outright saying, Why do you guys have to feel the need to change the rules? I think I know why, it's so they can use more writing tropes. Hey, post editing comment again. And one more inconsistency, and here's the inconsistency right here. At some point in time, a group of settlers were crazy enough to venture out into the northernmost continent of Salatos. I guess when you're that desperate, a frozen hunk of rock doesn't seem like such a bad place to call home. As a matter of fact, the harsh weather conditions proved to be just as useful as the mountain ranges when it came to keeping the creatures of Grim at bay. But it also kept the people of Mantle from flourishing. Hey, Miles, carry. You guys, uh, ever gonna acknowledge what you show in the world of Remnant now again? Huh? Is it too hard to do nowadays? It's a cartoon! Oh yes, it's a cartoon. A cartoon where there are serious topics such as toxic relationships, systematic oppression, same-sex relationships, death, and moral quandaries in its writing. Seriously, you cannot say it's a cartoon to me when your cartoon is being used as a talking point for these sorts of subjects. I mean, from where I stand, you kind of suck about talking about these subjects, but hey, my point is still standing. But let's talk about another inconsistency. <sighs> We're going back to that contrivance's point in that the Faunus is night vision. Now, knowing how impatient the internet is, I'm sure many people will point out this quote. Many Faunus are known to have nearly perfect sight in the dark. And I know people will point to many, and will say, not all. Unfortunately, I can't take that seriously. Not only in the first volume, we had Blake and Sun attend a White Fang meeting and use that night vision in order to escape, but that straight up ignored when Blake fights Ilya. So apparently, Blake has night vision and then does it, or she's gone blind and dumb, but that is really small potatoes because this opens up a really good question. What determines the night vision for Faunus? What is the logical reasoning for it? Well, it certainly can't be the animals that they're based off of, because funnily enough, scorpions, the animal that Tyrion is based off of, do not have night vision. Heck, they barely have any good vision at all. Meanwhile, the sheep girl, yes, sheep, are supposed to have great night vision. So I need to ask, what is the correlation? Where is the logic in this? It's almost as if they ignored this piece of lore just so they can make a contrived plot to point so that it doesn't really have any meaning to it. And yeah, there's no actual repercussions about this. The idea is to make the Grim attack due to people rioting. And in the first few moments of the next episode, the Grim are gone and everyone's already being arrested for their riot. 
Like, what the hell? So there's another thing that's inconsistent, although I'm not sure if it's considered inconsistency or just really poor writing, but... Ugh, whatever. This is a topic that I have already talked about before, and I've referred to it as the faunus being oppressed and how the show is terrible of showing this actually being the case. Granted, there are people who decide to ignore my reasonings for why I thought that and decide to think that I believe that minorities can't be oppressed because one of them is a position of power. No, I'm not kidding, there are people who actually think this and they are dumb for doing so. Let's talk about Jacques Schnee. I do understand what the show is going for him. Aside from the orange man bad stand-in, he's a terrible father. But the show, to me, has kind of shown a little bit of a confliction with that. Now, before you hit that dislike button, please give me a listen. There's a song called Loneliness of All, a song that I really don't like, but that being aside, it's being used to show Weiss's confliction in volume 4, and there's a particular line with it. I would like to point out that the show has only showed us the following. Jock's allowing Weiss to go to a school on a whole other kingdom, do whatever she wants as long as it doesn't affect his business or reputation. Honestly, it's kind of weird that to that point, the show didn't really offer that. In fact, one can even argue the show showed the opposite. Weiss is spending Jock's money in Beacon, she doesn't accept his calls, and when she's back home, she outright embarrasses him by attacking people at a party, pretty much committing a crime of assault. This isn't to justify Jock's behavior, because unless someone is attacking you, I don't think it's proper to hit a lady. But up until Volume 7, the show hasn't really shown me that Jock is as bad as they make it out to be. Especially when Weiss has been shown to not be completely innocent in this situation. I get it, Jox is supposed to be the abusive parent. Problem is that the biggest examples of this are restricted to the outside show sources. And screw you for telling me that I have to seek out supplemental content to understand what's going on in the show. It's the show's job to show me this. And then there's the point that Winter has no problem slapping Weiss around too, yet we're supposed to be supportive of her just because Weiss is. Along with accompanying verbal harassment too. Silence! Boom. The problem is that this is not lining up with what we've seen in the show, which seems to be a running trend of a number of supplemental materials and not matching up with the actual show. Also, can I take a moment to go off on a tangent? Not that it matters, because it's my video, my rules, YOU'RE NOT MY REAL FATHER! I have an issue with the whole supplemental materials thing, especially how people use it as a justification to explain the lack of plot explanation in the show, or anything in that regard. To an extent, I can understand, because too much exposition can bog down a story, but considering that Ruby tends not to really telegraph these sorts of things or explain how things can work, for example how the Faunus Night Vision seems to be really inconsistent, or how Aura works, it also screws up how things work when there's an established lore, and then the main story likes to contradict it. Not to mention, telling me to go watch the subliminal content doesn't really excuse the laziness in the show. These were things that in Final Fantasy XIII... Because for the first time ever, I got the barest glimpse of backstory and history and setting. Oh, we couldn't have the characters talk about this stuff. Oh no, yeah, you get to read that in fucking data logs. And in Destiny... Destiny's good story is in the Grimoire cards, dumbass. It's in the Grimoire cards. Sorry, I didn't know that. How about you read them, then remake this video? Did you even watch the fucking video? Did you even watch what I said? Did you even watch what I fucking said? You think I should compliment a game's story for requiring me to leave the video game, actively go away from the thing that's supposed to be telling me the story, log into my Bungie account on the fucking website, and go through some cards that you click, and they spin around all nice and animated, and then you can read the lore. Oh, that's really great storytelling. That's really making the most out of fucking video games. Wow, what a brand new medium. Reading cards on the internet, what a fucking great way of telling a story. Good job, Bungie, I take back everything I've said. That people complained about. Why should Ruby be any different? If I have to go away from the main story in order to understand the story, or how the character's abilities work, then that's a problem. Hell, we technically don't have a full understanding of how dust works. And no one ever wants to bother explaining in the actual show what it does. At best, it's a means of using energy, but other times it's used to actually create stone and ice pillars. Who knows, maybe I'm just an idiot. That's a definite possibility. But that to me still seems like an issue. So excuse me, you royal pains in the a So, I believe I made this point in the video that I don't like how the writers were handling the Robin situation. <laughs> but it's emblematic of a few other issues. One of them is the aforementioned Grim attack that was taken care of off screen. But in the process of writing this video, the latest episode came out and... I'll be reporting this rough treatment. 
All right. So, I've got a few questions. First off, the whole situation has practically nothing to hint at what's going to happen. What do I mean by this? Well, let's consider that in order to get this arrest, Weiss comes into footage of her father and the bad guy Watts talking. Footage that she got from her mother, who conveniently was recording the two. Even though Watts has the ability to control technology, and he apparently didn't use that ability to do that for any security cameras in the Schnee Mansion. This is kind of weird, and why? I get that he has to see it, but you would think that, hmm, I don't want anyone to see me. Maybe I should hack the entire system. I'm also kind of confused as to how Miss Schnee even got those cameras in there. How? Why? When? Are they... <laughs> Do they need batteries? What the hell's going on there? And I wouldn't have an issue with this if it wasn't for the fact there's nothing to set this up. There's no foreshadowing that this would happen. But hey, that's a minor complaint. What isn't a minor complaint, though, is Robin! Alright. Calm down, Common. Calm down. Have some smart water and then a snow cone. So, I totally get arresting Jacques Schnee. That's not the problem. The problem is, why hasn't Robin Hill been arrested? She broke the law, too, regardless of the voting interference, and she and her team have committed several crimes. Why is she getting a pass on this? With Robin redistributing the goods her team has stolen, the Amity Project is completely stalled. And don't tell me they don't have evidence because the Aesops are well aware that Robin attempted to steal supplies and outright told them that they get the supplies one way or another. Even if you don't believe that, the attempt to assault official members of the Atlas military, that's still a crime! Okay, let's rewind a bit and let's talk about a scene earlier in the season. It's the part where Ruby outright lies to Ironwood about the relic. Salem, the big evil bad with messed up hair and pretty much the most generic villain you could probably go with, Throughout the season up to this point, there's been a bit of a moral quandary going on with the group. See, in the past couple volumes, there was a theme of being lied to and how hiding the truth from people can hurt them. And during this volume, Ruby, the show, has had its characters debating about whether this is right or not. And the characters decide to tell the truth. But here's the thing, they don't let Ruby, the character who outright lied, be the one to speak it. Rather, it's another character, Oscar, who does the deed. What? That was a perfectly good opportunity for Ruby, the main character, to get some character development. That she can't be doing the same thing as the people who actively lied to her, or that there are repercussions for her actions. But nope! He's finally choosing the truth over fear. We should do the same. I'll tell him. I'm the one who chose to keep it from him in the first place. Ruby! Transport's leaving! I think you're needed elsewhere. You're sure? Yeah, I've got it. <laughs> Why confront the person you lied to? Take responsibility for your actions and actually, you know, grow up. I understand that she wanted to do it, but the fact that she didn't is kind of really off-putting to me. I mean, it's just character development. Who needs it? This is Ruby. It's not like we could have her actually, you know, take responsibility. Gotta make way for some useless shipping. It's not like you couldn't have Ruby tell Iron with the truth, telling the other people that I'll catch up with you because that's never been done before and have Oscar be there for moral support and could still have the scene where we learn that Oscar is fusing with Ozpin. Yeah, I know that's a whole thing I haven't talked about, but if you haven't seen the series, I understand it's weird for me to bring up, so just ignore it right now. But back to this point, I understand that Ruby is being told she needs to be elsewhere, but that's such a cop-out! She outright says that she's the one who lied, and it's not like there can't be other transports that take her down after she was done talking to Ironwood. In fact, we even learn that there are other transports afterwards that are going to take Oscar and Ironwood. Why can't there be another one for her? Look, is it too much to ask to have some proper character development and have the characters actually be confronting about what they did wrong. Ah. I guess so. Hi, post editing comment again, and this time for the entire section I'm about to talk about. I think it's important that when I point out that in my initial script, it was about chapter 8 when I finished it and started editing it. So this isn't what I was expecting to talk about since it's something that I did previously touch on in a previous video about Ruby, but I think it's important to talk about. Then this fucking fight scene happens. You're holding Blake hostage. You have leverage over Yang, you dumb thing idiot. And then what does this stupid, goofy mother do? Oh, she made me mad. Let me let her go and then go fight more. Huh? 
Chapter 12. Oh dear lord. Let me say right off the bat, on a technical level, the action scenes are impressive. Well, most of it is. I see someone's been watching JoJo. But the issue is that the context for the fights, and it's almost like every single character decided to ram their heads up against the walls before this whole situation, with how utterly stupid that everyone has become. So, let's start with the worst offender, and I'll give two examples. So, Crow. Considering that the situation was him fighting with Clover, the two really didn't need to fight, especially with Crow trying to disarm the situation. Heck, if you want to ask me, Robin's the main cause for escalating the situation when she wasn't under arrest. She assaulted Clover, and all Clover did was actually defend himself. I mean, what did Crow expect Clover to do? Take the arrow in the eye? They sat like mindless drones with no intelligence, unable to communicate with one another. Whatever happened to... Cut it out! Both of you, we're almost back to Atlas. Let's talk to James personally. But the dumbest thing about this fight, because if you know anything about the past between Crow and Tyrion, stuff that the show has shown us on screen, then you should know that Tyrion, who I may remind you all, is a homicidal maniac who works for the big bad of the series, and has almost killed Crow and his family in the past. That raises a pretty good question. Why the hell would you work with him? You know he's not trustworthy, so what the hell? And even then, why the hell would you work with him and not expect something like this to happen? Obviously, this movie has its head up its own anus. Also, small nitpick, apparently Tyrion can teleport because he certainly wasn't behind Clover before he stabbed the guy. I know what the staff are trying to go for, and that this is Crow's fault. But this isn't due to his bad luck semblance or his character flaws. This is him just being stupid. Especially when early in the episode he was shown to trying to be reasonable about this. But let's go to another example that's a little bit... less... terrible, I guess? And that would be Mero. He's that dog faunus I brought up earlier, and he has the ability to freeze people with a command so long as they're in front of him. And yet, when he has a clear shot at Team Ruby, or later when he has Weiss and her knight who are doing epic posing, for some reason he elects to not use them until after she and her knight have broken apart. Do you see why this is frustrating? If you have to make characters stupid or gimp them, for the sake of the plot, then that's not good writing. It doesn't matter how pretty or how well choreographed the fights are. Even if you slather a cake with pink and blue frosting, the cake is still burnt to a crisp, it's still gonna taste terrible. All I want is for characters to be consistent. And I don't want characters to just become idiots just for the sake of plot convenience. Look, like I said in my video of the Steven Universe movie, I don't let a fan base dictate to me the quality of a show, and don't get me wrong, it's really easy to do that, especially with Ruby, since Rooster Teeth does seem to have a tendency to pander to its fans, so it's not like it's hard to see how the fandom can affect the product. But for the sake of brevity, I'll refrain from outright accusing the fan base of being the reason why Ruby has problems that makes me conflicted over the series. Rather, I'll just blame the piss poor writing. It's kind of what you get when you get platypuses writing the story. But hey, now that I've pissed off the fan base, let's see how long it'll take for people to be offended by my opinions and take me out of context to make me look like a bad person. Oh, too late again. In any case, I'm Manga Common. Thanks for watching. Hope you have a nice day, and remember to examine a your fandom. Bye bye. And so, yeah, I think you, you just have to try and remind yourself, like, this is clearly a person that is just being ugly, and also they misspell, they use the wrong form of there, so shut up, I'm not gonna listen to you. But then the people, but the people that do come and say, I, I really like this, I did have some issues with it, well thought out, well worded stuff, because that shows that they're also considerate. And again, it's, it's, it's not that I'm only gonna listen to the comments that are nice, but I'm just, that's just psychology. I'm much more likely to listen to you if you come to me wanting to have a conversation and not an argument. If you go into a conversation with someone and you're like, we're fighting, everybody's on the defensive right there and it's, it's no good. Oh, oh, this is getting so intense.